welcome and thanks for having me today. Thanks, Miriam, uh, and thank you all of you for attending the session. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about blockchain today. It's uh, it could be a one-on-one -on -one or it could be more advanced, uh, depending on you. So a little bit about me first. Um, so I'm, I have two hats right now. I am uh, working at Collaborex, which is a not-for-profit uh, that uh, co-founded last summer uh, with the goal of uh, incentivizing the development of uh, research, development software algorithm for blockchain. So we do, uh, we do crowdfunding, we raise money, and we give that money to responsible researchers who are doing important research on blockchain, could be scalability, interoperability, interoperability security, and pretty much the only condition attached is that the software be released as open source. So that's, uh, that's Collider X. Um, I'm also working uh, at Consensus. So Collider X more like on the charity front, uh, more like uh, not just sitting on the board of these uh, not-for-profits. As a day job, so that's becoming interesting, I managed to work on blockchain as well. Uh, Consensus is the largest blockchain company in the world. We have about 1,000 employees at that time. Uh, we're in 30 different countries. Some of my colleagues are today in, uh, in Israel. Um, we are we're doing uh, a development in all the parts of the world. We just announced, for example, uh, a deal with the Union Bank in the Philippines, uh, doing a settlement across uh, uh, a lot of uh, banks, I think 80 banks here in the, in the Philippines, and doubled with the world premiere with Amazon Web Services for the deployment of blockchain as a service on Amazon. So consensus, we're going to talk more about this, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a, a teacher, I studied as a math teacher, and I worked in uh, government for a while, I got involved, I got very passionate about uh, policy and how you could affect uh, not just 30 kids in your class, but a whole province, a whole organization into government, so as getting into innovation and pushing open source into government. Uh, my role as a tech expert in the Ministry of Education opened me a lot of doors where I could help different departments. Um, so I helped the government, the Ministry of Government Services to do procurement for the first procurement for software as a service at the time. Um, I was involved in the development of the Intellectual Property Directive for the government of Ontario and many other very interesting projects. I later uh, worked two years at Cisco, so at Cisco I jumped the border in the private sector trying to help uh, both Cisco and our customers in education to innovate. Imagine what is the public sector of the future, what does a smart and connected world look like, and uh, try to bridge the gap between a tech company and customers, which frankly have been realizing that this gap is only getting bigger. When we talk about fourth industrial revolution, that makes for a nice title of a book and a nice things to read, but really what's happening is nobody really gets it on the field. So you're talking to the CEO of a bank or the president of a university, and it's very theoretical. They have a hard time grasping what is really happening to the industry and to put the cursor on how much risk they should actually uh, put in um, uh, tech. Like how urgent is the situation and how drastic the changes they have to implement today so they can stay in business in five years or 10 years. So blockchain, AI, these are disruptive technologies that make the matter a little more worse. Because uh, I'm just quoting somebody from a, a friend from a pension plan uh, we were giving a panel uh, last week. He said, it looks like in blockchain, uh, one month is equivalent to one year in other technologies. And, and it, I kind of agree with that. Things are moving at a speed that's really mind-blowing. It's really hard to keep up. Uh, and then I work for a boutique firm. Uh, so by now you should have understood I'm a really big fan of open source. I've uh, been in open source for 20 years. Uh, it was my dream to work for Sour Fair Linux because they started their business pre-2000 while I was in Mexico. 
And uh, I was looking at the business and I really wish I was with them starting the business and I had the chance to actually be part of the business uh, just a few years. So, Colanoax uh, just got you through this. So we collect funds and we give uh, money to, uh, uh, to developers. So we raised $2 million in funds last year. We're going through another round of crowdfunding. We have some big checks for uh, from enterprise, and we have some personal individual donations as well. Um, last summer, we went after the, the funding from the government for the super clusters, and we raised uh, fifty million dollars in pledges for uh, different groups in partnership with the two blockchain associations of Canada, with the Blockchain Research Institute, and with the ICTC. To show demonstrating that there's a huge interest in there. There's still a lot of. Uh, uh, synergies around that. We incorporated a biz, um, an organization uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, consensus, just a few words about consensus so you really understand where I'm coming from because I'm drawing a lot of examples from the consensus world in there so you really need to understand where consensus fits in all that. Consensus is a venture production studio. So we are out there to create businesses and ventures. We're started by Joseph Lubin. Joseph Lubin is a Torontonian. He, uh, he studied in Toronto and just went to the US to do a lot of his career. He's a Princeton graduate, worked for Goldman Sachs. 2007-2008 financial crisis went frankly disgusted from all of this and uh, went to do other things and came back uh, around 2013-2014, uh, worked on, with the original Ethereum team in Toronto and uh, build that, uh, that fantastic technology which is now Ethereum, the leading uh, blockchain infrastructure with the most number of developers in, in the world. 30, 40 times more developers than the second uh, blockchain uh, after Ethereum. Um, so the thing for when you develop a new network like the internet, uh, the next thing that you think is why is that good for? And the answer is nothing. It's not good for nothing if you don't have apps or services that you can use on a network. You need value on that network. That's what makes the value of the network. It's all this independent value you can draw from all the peers in that network. So Joe started consensus to create those businesses that will create those apps and those services to add value to that, that business. So we have... Um, Five different things we're doing right now. We are doing solutions. So I'm part of the solutions. We are doing consulting for the enterprise market. So bringing that to the, the banks, the oil and gas super majors. Uh, we work uh, Microsoft with our first customers. Um, we work for GSK. We work for big banks. Work for the worldwide fund for all kind of different industries and companies. Infrastructure is. Um, some of the products that we actually build are not monetized today. They're uh, infrastructure, layer protocol, security, um, plugins that you can use to uh, bridge to that world. So these are, uh, and also development tools that are free for download. So for example, MetaMask is about one million download. Truffle Suite is the leading developer studio for Ethereum. It's about half a million download by now. Uh, capital, we have a couple of things in capital. We have $50 million fund to invest in startups that are in blockchain. We're starting an accelerator program. In education, we have uh, industry back certifications. In products, we have, in the products, we have 40, 50 different startups that we incubate inside consensus. Some of the examples that we give later, I'm drawing back, I'm drawing from these startups. In, in, and the reason is, is because that's the, the one I know the most doesn't mean that's the only ones out there. There's plenty of different interesting things going on in that space. <coughs> so, uh, I want to make this a little bit interactive, so uh, if you have a cell phone or tablet or something, you want to play with something, you can uh, download Uport, and we'll come back to that uh, later. Um, we are... Um, So how many of you uh, know about blockchain today? You say, I've heard about blockchain. Okay. 
it's about good. How many of you would say they understand how blockchain works? Okay, kind of the same. You guys are very technical. Okay. So I'm going to go a little bit faster. So the, the whole idea of blockchain comes, let's take the historical perspective here, starting with the, the, the whole phenomenon that started with Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is really the killer app for blockchain. It doesn't mean that blockchain is all about bitcoins and about cryptocurrencies, but it's, it's like email or the web for the internet. It's what the first thing we think about. So, uh, and it's easy to explain. So, the problem with crypto money or digital money has been that you are able to copy very easily. So, if I take a banknote and I scan it, uh, and if I could send a banknote by email just by sending a picture of a banknote, Everybody could take that picture and copy paste multiple times and become rich you know, on, on, on the moment. So obviously that doesn't work. So what makes it work? So if Bob wants to send to Alice some money and doesn't want, shouldn't be allowed to deploy that, duplicate that money. The way that blockchain solves that problem is conceptually by having a ledger behind the scenes where you have one central place in the web where the transaction is uh, recorded and that everybody can look at. So if everybody can look at that ledger, then you can, you can see where the money went. So there is no more double spending because if I always spend my money, you can check my, my money also will spend and you don't accept me sending another transaction. Now, to make it more interesting, um, a lot of people can use that ledger from anywhere in the world. And where is that ledger? It's decentralized. So everybody kind of keeps a copy of that ledger. Very similar if you understand how BitTorrent is working. Uh, there's computers that are always online connected to that network. They talk to each other on a network that sits on top of the internet. So the internet really connects everybody. These computers use the internet to connect to each other and they form a super network on top of the internet and they use their own protocol to talk to each other. What do they talk about? They talk about their ledger. Uh, they talk about the transaction they receive and they make sure that everybody is in sync. Ethereum, which I told you that consensus is mostly about Ethereum. What is Ethereum in one word is Bitcoin, this kind of Bitcoin ledger infrastructure, plus the ability to program some uh, uh, scenario scripts that we call smart contracts. So smart contracts is the idea that you could do, you can program something in advance. So it could be something as simple as a bet. Or you could say, oh, I'm betting with uh, Victor here that tomorrow at noon is going to rain in Toronto in this location. You can program that bet. I'm putting some money in there. I'm going to put one Ether, one Bitcoin. Uh, it does the same. And we pump the contract to, let's say, the weather network with the right code. And the contract checks the thing at the right time, check the information, and then decides where the money should go. So if I win, I get all the money in his crow. If he wins, he gets all the money in his crow. So very simple. Smart contracts, though, now, Years after, with years of you know, sophistication, now we understand that smart contracts can be used to do things like programmable equity, for example. So what if you have a share in a company that is, by, from the beginning, programmed to act in a certain way? So for example, if I buy a share, the share can be programmed in such a way that I cannot take my money back at first, uh, before three months. So I'm investing in a company for a certain time and that dividends are already programmed in advance. So the regulators are starting to lack these kind of ideas. There's a lot of defects with, uh, let's say, crypt the crypto world with the, that scares the regulator. A lot of scams that you probably heard about with these ICOs. People are just putting a white paper out there, asking for money, gets tons of millions of dollars, and then go to Mexico or Colombia or any fun place and send the money there because they, and then they defraud the investors. Um, so this is not good, so the regulators are paying attention, but the good news is that you can use the same tool, the same technology to enforce good behavior. So we're all learning and this, this is happening. 
So blockchain is, um, is a lot of things. It can uh, coordinate multiple actors, it can program behaviors, store value. Um, what makes a blockchain? Uh, certain characteristics make a blockchain. One uh, important characteristic is immutability. So if you have some kind of a bank record, you don't want anybody to go in there and change anything on it. And if it's keeping track of money, you don't want anybody to fiddle with your money behind your back. But if it tracks any other things, if it tracks um, a ticket to a movie theater, if it tracks a piece of real estate, if it tracks uh, your, uh, your number in a queue waiting for something to happen, uh, it's the same idea. You don't, want, you, you don't want anybody to be able to, to, to fiddle with that. What's also important is after a financial crisis, we understand that banks can fail, but can fail, but they don't fail, really fail. So who pays the bill is the customer, is, is the taxpayer, that's all of us. And uh, we understand that central banks are doing a lot of manipulation. We've seen the currencies in some countries going up and down like crazy and people getting really scared or uh, depressed to a point that uh, or took one of loss of life. A very dramatic situation. So what blockchain enables is to um, avoid to have any central points, uh, to have an algorithm that actually decides by somehow look around in all the nodes and look at the voting and get some kind of a consensus around all of the participants in that network to come to a conclusion that is not dictated or not controlled by a single peer like a central bank or by a group of authoritative peers like a group of central banks a group of predetermined arbiters or people that have or groups that have control. Um, this is very important because a lot of um, a lot of work in that blockchain space is designed to implement game theory to make sure that no no single one can take over the the, the network, rewrite history, or, or gain um, you know game the, the system one way or another. So immutability is really cool to other things. Cryptography is a tool, is a mean that allows everything to work behind the scene. I have a slide on cryptography, but it's nothing new in cryptography, really. It's just a few things that, uh, that we know, we understand digital signature, uh, public key infrastructure, these things that you're already using, you know or you don't know, but you're already using it. And uh, decentralization is very important, I've touched a little bit about that. So, if I follow that definition, you have a lot of blockchains out there, lots of blockchain technology, I'm not going to name them, that are not really blockchain, um, because they fail to address immutability. And one of the Reason why is when you have a limited number of nodes that make the decision, like if it, even if it's a gang of five or gang of six, these five or six, they can still collude, like we've seen with the LIBOR rate in the UK a few years ago, right? So if there's a possibility of collusion, that's probably not a good blockchain. Not a blockchain. So cryptography is a couple of very key primitives here. The hashing function, if you have a hashing, hashing is a mathematical formula that takes any kind of digital binary, kind of any, any file, any kind of thing you digitally throw at it, and put it in a box, fixed format, same number, and the mathematical function is optimized to distribute evenly. So you're very likely to obtain a unique ID or fingerprint for something you throw at it. Right? So you throw at it your birthday or your, everything that makes your digital identity. Any file can have a, very, a unique fingerprint. Okay? That's important because then you can keep track of things after that with that hash. The asymmetric key cryptography uh, is something we use uh, behind the scenes. If you have a VPN network, 
uh, if you're using the web and you see HTTPS in your browser, there is some kind of public key cryptography happening behind the scenes. Um, it's, uh, it's a great invention, if you think about it. When you, you're a kid, you play secret passwords. Uh, usually it's a reversible password which is very easy to break. Public key cryptography is based on the idea of a math mathematical function that is makes it easy to go one way, but it's very easy to re very hard to reverse, impossible to reverse. So you have you end up with two keys. If you're using your public key and you use that public key to encrypt, only the one the person that has the private key can decrypt something that's been encrypted with the public key. So you can leave your public key elsewhere, you can leave it in a closet, you have folded by a window, you can put it on the internet, doesn't really matter. People can take it, encrypt things, send it to you, or put it online. You are the only one that can decrypt that message. So you can store anything on the internet, you can, you're the only one that can read it. Uh, then you can use combination of hashing with public-private key to do digital signature. So now you can do things like proving that the message is coming from someone, and you can verify, yeah, that, that, that is the person, that's the only person that can have sent that message to me. That's a, a true meaning of signature. Now, <clears throat> who understands kind of proof of work, how the things work behind the scenes now? So this is getting interesting, because all those nodes in the network, uh, they need to work with each other, right? So how does that work? So this is a visualization of the blockchain. Just let's start with that. Um, people have, in the early days, you need to download, let's say, you need to download software on your computer, have a node connect to that big network. Talking to that node, you can create an account. An account in the blockchain is really a set of public and private key that allows you to encode, decode your account. Um, then you can send transactions to your node, but you can't really send transactions to any node. So these transactions are being sent, they float somewhere in the main pool and they float around. All the nodes that are on the network, the software, they talk to each other and make sure they have the same copy of the transaction. So they maintain a steady state. Uh, basically, a blockchain is a state machine. Make sure every, every, everybody is in sync with each other. And then at some point, as you've seen here, these transactions, they go to a block. They, somebody takes those transactions, write them in a block, as many as they can put in there, and commit that block in a way. <laughs> and then they continue. The next block is formed after, and it's, there is kind of a direction. You cannot just write anything, and then back, uh, there is a link between that block and that block and that block. So there is a sense of history. So you, you add on top of it. Next question is, who is writing that block? So it needs to be a node. So let's say you have a 1,000 computers connected to the network. One of these computers is going to be in charge to write that, that thing. What if it's only always the same one? Well, you have a problem because if I have control, then I can be somehow perverted or corrupted to actually take advantage of this control. If I know if it's always me, then I can prepare and plan my thing and cheat a little bit. So there is a random selection. There's many ways, actually, many ways to select a node. The most current one right now for Bitcoin and the one used for Ethereum as well at this point in time is called proof of work. So a node, all the nodes they compete, they solve some mathematical equation. It's like bingo. The first one that finds the answer says, I have it, right? So the other people say, how come you have it? But you just show your bingo card, looks at all the things out there, I have it. So it's very easy to verify that someone found the solution. So one, the, the node that got the, the thing right, they just got elected to fill that block, the next block. Next time around, same competition, another node might be selected. But right now, 
and the node will decide what's in there. So I'm taking a lot of transactions. I can pick the transactions I want. So most nodes are very rational. They look in the transactions and they look for the, uh, the tip. Because when you send a transaction on the Ethereum network, you can leave a little extra money in there. So the person that has the opportunity to write that note, they look in there and say, okay, this is like a, they, they, they classify. They use, they take the transaction that have the most tip, the better, the better, better money in there, and they write those. Feel free to ask questions if you... Uh, Oh, I have to ask a question. Yeah. So, um, I guess that's called mining, right? That's mining, you know, so exactly. So they're, that's pulling, the mining. they're getting a little commission out of every transaction? Yes. So does it, Plus the team. So doesn't that sort of depend on a pyramid system where money has to keep coming in? Um, How can they keep everybody to take on money uh, unless money's coming in? Well, it's different from different blockchains, right? So, so this is where fine-tuning, there's different rules. For Bitcoin, yes. Uh, for Bitcoin, that's very clearly what's, ha what's happened. Uh, Ethereum, uh, there is a concept of gas, right? So you pay for what you use. So your transaction costs something. Uh, when you send a transaction, you, you basically pay for the, the fee of the transaction that is used to pay for mining right now. Um, and so what's that fee? Like, what's it relative to like just banking transactions? So it, it, it varies. Uh, there is an interesting site, if you go to this, it's called the Ethereum Gas Station. And it shows you um, a dashboard and you can see the, the recommended fee that you have to pay. So you don't have to worry as a user. When you use a wallet or use a, an exchange, they usually pick up that number from, from an API and they use it for you. You can use the default. You can tweak it a little bit if you want it to be faster. So, so, like on average, what's the fee like? So is it like well, yeah, it depends. 0.5% or something? Yeah, it could be cents or dollars right now. Sorry? In that order of cents or dollars. It depends. It depends on the blockchain, but on Ethereum, it's not that much. So on a $100 transaction, what's the fee? Well, I don't think the, 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 the fee depends on the amount you send. It's going to be the same. Whatever you send, one dollar equivalent or million dollar, the fee is the same, and it's in the amount of cents or dollars. It's like in the theory, we could so Google you it. Can, you can build a contract and do these rules, so it depends on the complexity of these rules and not the uh, the value that you put in those rules, right? So yeah, so I'm trying to to keep it very light and simplified, but yeah, so you have two type of transactions in Ethereum. You have uh, signing, let's say, signing something direct, account to account, and there is that fee, and there is a smart contract. So if you activate a smart contract, you send a transaction to a smart contract, it will execute the code in there. So there is a, a guarantee that the code won't run in an infinite loop that will draw the system to a halt. So that, that, that smart contract will consume your transaction, and when money is running out, then it stops. You can write it before it is complete. So that's where also transaction, uh, the fee comes in to ensure. So proof of work is very expensive. It consumes a lot of electricity. It's somehow complex. Uh, the, the fees are more expensive than you'd like, but it's the price you have to pay to maintain security and to maintain trust that nobody can game the system. Ethereum, though, is moving to another proof of uh, consensus algorithm. So you have different ones. And that's all about how you select a node. You could do round robin, which is basically throwing a dice, throwing a, and see whoever is elected at that point in time. That could, uh, that could work. You have proof of authority, where you design those five nodes, or 10 nodes, or 12 nodes, or two nodes ahead of time, say, only those can do anything of interest in there. They, they command everything. But I told you about the issues about that one. Uh, the benefit is transactions are really fast, and somehow it, 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 people who like command and control, they like that because they want to keep control. But there are drawbacks. Uh, Raft, democracy, people, you can have some, some, some game in there where people elect each other, they elect nodes. 
And uh, right now we are using proof of work. But the next one to come online for Ethereum is proof of stake, where um, it's based on game theory. And it's not going to use the mining thing. It's going to use um, a game of stake. So you can trust the nodes because the nodes are going to be incentivized in acting in the right way. How so? If they act the right way, they're going to get a little reward. If they don't act well, and the other nodes detect that somebody is doing something funny there, well, that node is punished. How, how the node is punished? Because they have to stack some money, something in an escrow account. So you have to block, block some money, and somehow you, it makes it, it's, it's generating revenue if, if you're acting well, but if you're doing something funny, then your money disappears and you're being slashed. Big punishment, small rewards. And that should maintain the system. So that's why Ethereum is moving through a, a transition. So no more mining, no more uh, waste of energy. <laughs> Any other question on that? Um, <clears throat> okay, so I think that covers pretty much thing. Um, so every computer maintains a record. Every computer is in sync. You somehow have a guarantee that you, things will happen the way it's supposed to happen and you don't have to trust the other parties. If you are sending money, you know that the money is, uh, is, is, is received. If you uh, you are activating a contract, you somehow have the guarantee that the contract is being, is being executed. There is one issue with that, is you can still be overcome if more than half of the network takes, more than half of the nodes are taking control, but it's really extremely hard to get more than half of the nodes to take control of the network. And uh, you know, a few months ago, it was worth $7 billion to take the control of the network for just 10 minutes. So it makes it, not impossible, but very hard to achieve and, and very undesirable because if you can hack a bank, it would probably cost you less than $7 billion to do a hold up and hack a bank than just try to mess with the network. Yeah. So smart contracts, I talked a little bit about it. Um, so to sum it up, how does that work? You're sending uh, a transaction to somebody, uh, to Roger, for example, the, my transaction has been sent to the network, it's been replicated to all the nodes. At some point, why node is going to be elected to write down the ledger, it's going to do so after some time the block is being validated, the work is being validated by other nodes, and I'm getting verified validation, yes, 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 and my money is committed, I can be sure the transaction has been moved. So, <clears throat> Ethereum can think of it as a global computer. What you have running on one node is exactly what is running on other nodes. And you can do very interesting things. So what can you do with that? So you can do, for example, I'm going to skip a few things in there. You can do, for example, asset tokenization. So this is really, 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 really hot right now. This goes beyond crypto. What if we could take any asset gold, silver, a building, a ship, whatever is of value, like a, a watch, a Ferrari car, and we could assign a unique ID to it, and put that ID as a ticket, or token as we call it, and put it on the digital platform, where you can transact that thing, but you can even transact in a, in a programmable, trusted way, and programmable way. So, Let's say you could have a, a token represent building and say, I want to build, I want to buy only 10% of that building. And that, what if that contract or token could keep track that you own that 10% of that building there? So um, this is scenarios that are actually being worked at the banks and some some scenarios that are being worked at Dubai, for example, we have a project called uh, Landstream, and we implemented a similar solution. And it, a startup came up called Meridio, and uh, 
they've been featured on CNN uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they, they're exactly doing exactly that kind of model. So it's for real estate investment, where you can deal with fractional ownership of the. Uh, what if you could do custody and escrow? Now you have a lot of money, so you could tokenize gold, but you have all this crypto money. Um, how, where do you store it? How do you secure that money? How do you make sure you can recover it? How do you make sure that you can pass it to your heir? These are very, very difficult questions. Lawyers, for example, they, want to, they don't want to keep your private key and public key. So these are a lot of solutions that are being built, new startups, new solutions. Provenance tracking, like what if you could keep track of a fish? Uh, where, where does the food come from? Uh, where does intellectual property or that ownership of that piece of code, line of code, or music you wrote, what if you could keep track of it and all the uh, chain of titles and the der derived work that keep, uh, keep, keep flow are flowing from there? So these are really fine grains uh, things you could do. Um, we talked about digital identity in the workshop. So we actually have a work with uh, um, um, we have a, a team called Uport, and they they are engaging with a lot of groups, including the Decentralized Identity Foundation, uh, that counts other members like Microsoft and other leading uh, IT companies, and trying to solve the problem of how to secure your identity. So come to the the, a world where you don't want your identity to be stored by some random multinationals hosted in the US with some laws or could be maybe hosted somewhere in the country with no laws. Uh, but anyway, it's all the same. They keep your data and they do whatever they want with it maybe and they, they, they do things and you get nothing in exchange. So what if we could flip that system and say, I am the one who keeps my data I keep all my data in a box that's locked and encrypted and everything. I keep it on my own computers if I want to. I keep it on the web on some kind of Dropbox or storage online encrypted if I want to. It depends on the level of confidence we have. But then I own the key to that data and I'm sharing that data, the data I want, when I want, with who I want. So don't you find it weird when you go to a bar asking for a drink, because you're all good looking, especially the ladies, you know, I'm sure they're asking you for your edge all the time, so you look like under 19, under 21. So you have to give your driver license. On your driver license, you have your address, you have your name, full name, birth date. This is totally too much information. You can use a lot of this data, Google you on Facebook, you need to find, I mean, if they find the name of your mom and the name of your first pet, then you're, you're, you're fried because they can hack your, your Facebook account. So what if you could just have this information shared with government, say, look, government, you have my birth certificate. This is my claim. I'm claiming that I'm older than 20, 21 years old. Can you verify, can you validate that claim? Government says, looking at... Uh, your birth certificate, Mr. Lijou, yes, definitely you're way older than 21. Yes, and the claim is validated. So they put a digital signature on, on that claim. Now I'm going to the bar, and I don't have to share anything I don't want to share. I can just share my claim and say, look, the government says yes, that's right. And we can get the claims signed by a lot of people, government, uh, school, uh, friends, and whoever you want. Probably the more the better, the more you can trust. So, <clears throat> furthermore, identity is way more than just your passport number and your birth date and your name. It's also your digital footprint. Uh, it's also the sites you log into. You know, why are these cookies tracking you? Because this has some value. People want to know, oh, you've been there, you've been there, I can cross reference it, you have that. And they make a shape of you as a, as a customer. What if you could connect to the world through different touch points? So when I connect to Google, when I connect to my bank, when I connect to Facebook, I can use different logins or different IDs, but all generated from my own single identity that I control. So now, 
I'm interacting with the external world with different kind of ideas, scrambling my footprints on the digital world and making it really hard for people to track me. So that's another level of, of security. Um, <clears throat> so you port that you downloaded allows you to do to do that, for example. They have some uh, some API. So <clears throat> Um, so if you want to play a little bit with Uport, here's uh, an app, uh, uh, a demo that we have. Uh, try to, yeah. So on the app, So this video shows you different screens that you have on the app. The app is very simple. You have your name, okay. You have your name, and you have a number of um, um, of things. I'm going to give you the slides, and you can go over this. But basically, you take a screenshot of a QR code, and it will allow you to do different things. You can uh, single sign on, for example, in the site with your QR code. Just scan your QR code. Get a notification on your app says, Oh, do you want to log in in there? Say, Yeah, okay, I want to log in in there. Boom. And it will tell the website that it's you, and the website will log you in uh, without login, without something that can track you. Uh, okay. So, very quickly, I'm going to show you a couple other examples. So, um, things that you can do with blockchain. So, this is our traditional management notification tool, uh, TMNT. So, that's a group of uh, Wallaloo. Um, uh, Brian Peter is leading that. He's an uh, alumni from, alumnus from uh, Mario Vision. Uh, he has a terrific team in Wallaloo. The whole idea is to say it's a Google map for your company. So, you can map out where people work. So at consensus, we are organized as a holocracy in circles. So you can assign yourself to different circles. So I'm in the Canada circle, I am the solution circle. People can look for me on the map and they can know where I am, which team I'm part of. And if they click on me, they have some kind of LinkedIn profile that belongs to me with some of my information. What do I do? Where do I live? My phone number, how to, my Slack, how to contact me. And that's internal at the company. We have civil, so civil is out there to, to go after fake news. So it use, it's, think of it as a Huffington Post, so everybody can come up with news and articles, but somehow there is a consensus mechanism that goes around like some kind of peer review that the crowd is going to say, well, this is the real news and like, forget about those news that are not so much interesting. And, and there is no central part, there is no sensor in there, it's the crowd that uh, that. Um, this is the Union Bank I, I told you about. So it's about settlement between banks in the in the Philippines. So uh, Viant is up there to uh, to do the, the tracking, tracking of the fish, tracking of intellectual property. They work with uh, top oil and gas super major, um, and they. Uh, They've been featured on, our, on the CNN video as well, as I mentioned earlier. Um, Alethio is the big data and AI visualization tool. So what they do is they combine blockchain and the big data analytics machine learning. So they take a copy of a very a copy that's very close from the data on the Ethereum network on traditional IT systems that are optimized for high throughput. So they, now they can run all the, the good things, the Hadoop, the Spark, and all this, this machine learning and all this AI tools. So you can output visualization. So this one is a study that's been done on the spread of uh, the uh, Gnosis token uh, after the token launch. So people are buying this token, where does the token go? Uh, Uport, we talked about Uport uh, in a minute. So it's being deployed at the city of Zug. In, uh, in Switzerland to do plebiscites, so vote, vote, votation. 
referendum. Uh, future of work. So what is, you know, you work, the nature of work is changing. So people are working more time work. There is the gig economy. So maybe you're working just for a simple task, a micro task. Maybe you're just doing a logo, or maybe you're just doing a one week uh, worth of work to do some research for some firm, and then you move on to the next one. So the bounties network allows you to put those tasks online. Say, I need a logo. And people come in, and they compete, and they are uh, paid. And this is all adju adjudicated and coordinated using blockchain and a consensus mechanism in the back. So uh, if you think a little bit about it, it's, it's really crazy, because uh, there is no person behind it adjudicating where the money goes if the task is complete. It's, a, it's based on consensus that's described by the Delphi uh, white paper, and the, uh, the lead architects and, and, and CEO of that startup is a uh, young kid from, the, from Waterloo. Uh, Grid Plus is an example in energy, so it's about if you have some extra energy output from your house, maybe in your uh, very green you have some solar panels, you can uh, sell or resell your energy to your neighbor. Uh, and uh, we're working with the regulators in Texas to, to have this, uh, this launch. It's a very promising uh, scenario globally. Um, you have Balance, which is some kind of uh, QuickBooks for uh, crypto. So it has some very interesting properties. Uh, beyond the things, you can do your chart of accounts, income statements and everything, prepare your tasks, you know, your taxes. But the fact that crypto you can actually track things over time, so there are some interesting strategies you could use to do your accounting on the blockchain. And uh, this one is the fractional ownership of real estate I was telling you about, uh, Meridio. And uh, I think that's only a few examples uh, that, that applications can be developed. There are multiple ones, so what is blockchain today? Blockchain looks like the internet was in 95, it's, uh, it's a very immature, emerging, fascinating world where we're building technology that could be the next Google or the next, the, not, the next big platform. The only difference is part of the core principles that we wanted to make, uh, to make it fair for everyone. We want, we don't want a few companies to capture the full value. We want to push the value to the, to the edge of the network and allow every single individual to capture the value that they generate on that platform. So that's, that's the hope that we have. And, and please uh, reach out to me if you're fascinated or interested by blockchain and as fascinated as I am. Thank you.